service and he still is feeling great. Awesome. Just awesome to see God move. And I was just reminded of Tessa here and, and uh, she was healed of, um, I don't know if you guys remember some time ago, um, uh, um, her name, uh, Alyssa, had a word of knowledge for someone with um, stomach issues and uh, Tessa got prayed for and she was healed. And uh, it was just, it's just awesome to see God move and uh, he loves you so much. He really does. And, and we believe Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus never turned anybody away. You know, what's amazing is in the gospels, the people that received the miracles are the ones you wouldn't expect based on how we're raised in church a lot of times. You know, we're raised in church um, and, and especially in American culture, it's a very performance driven culture. Um, uh, the blessings of God, the grace of God, the love of God is dependent upon how well you perform, how well you do. Um, for instance, a good example of that would be if you know someone was to walk into this service tonight that was not saved and and they were drunk and high and drugged up, you know, and they sat there in the back or something. Every one of us would go in the back and say, "Hey, welcome. God loves you." You know, God cares about you. You know, he can set you free from these things and so forth. And say they give their life to Jesus, but say a couple months pass by and they still coming in drunk and high and on drugs and, and, and cussing and swearing. That same Christian that was so merciful, compassionate and gracious ain't so merciful, compassionate and gracious. Why? It's because we think the standards change. We think that the grace of God is for when you're not saved, but once you get saved, now the standard change, and now God's de placing demands on you. You know what Romans 5 says? How much more, after being saved, shall we be saved by the life of his son? It's the exact opposite. If there was that much grace and compassion and love for the ungodly one, how much more for the son and the daughter that believes and is saved? That was a good place that... <clears throat> Um, no, no, hey, 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 guys, come on, you know, we, we don't have to, we don't have to do that, I just get excited, you know me, but uh, that, that's, that's, but that, why, why would it be that God's answer to sin, or God's answer to those things is grace, not judgment, why, because judgment does not change people, and God wants you free, if judgment set people free, Egypt and Pharaoh would have been set free instead of destroyed. Judgment destroys. Grace sets people free. It says in Romans 6, 14, for sin will have no dominion over you because you are not under law, but under grace. It is the grace of God. It is the love of God that sets people free, that fills their hearts, that now when temptation comes and they're faced with the decision, do I give in to this they now have the opportunity, you know what? Instead of trusting in this ability to make me feel good, I'm gonna trust in Jesus's love. And now when they trust in Jesus's love, that love sets them free and they're free and delivered from that, amen? If you can, real quick, before Brandon comes up, I want you to look at John chapter six, verse one. I said this in the morning service, I thought that was pretty good. Um, but the theme here with Brandon being here is uh, Brandon has an amazing testimony of what happens when you give your life to God. Not just part of your life, but your entire life. When you give your career, when you give your job, when you give your time, your energy, and you stop living for yourself and actually start living for Jesus. And what that does and, and how that changes your life. And you're going to hear from Brandon how it changed his life. And he is who he is today because of what God has done in his life and how he gave his life to Jesus, and how he gave not just his life and you know things, but how he gave baseball to Jesus, playing baseball, and how we went from struggling to playing in the majors, but we'll hear that from him. But in John chapter six, uh, in verse one, it says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And when Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples, now the Passover, a feast of the, Jews was, uh, feast of the Jews was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him for he knew himself, he knew what he would do. Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not enough for them that every one of them may have a little. 
One of his disciples, Andrew, call out to shout out to Drew back there, Drewzy. Uh, Andrew said, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Notice here the disciples are lack-minded. They're natural-minded. They're looking at what they don't have, and they're looking at the impossibility where Jesus already knew what he would do. Jesus was over here kingdom of God-minded, abundance-minded. Now think about this. Those five loaves and two small fish in the lad's hand, in the young boy's hand, what are they worth? Five loaves and two small fish. That's all it's worth. But what happens when you take what God has given in you, what the talents God has given you, the giftings God has given you, the things that he, the dreams. We have all, I mean, every one of you guys in here, awesome stories of, of what God has placed in you, dreams, passions, desires, that he has placed in you for a purpose because he wants to work with you and he wants those to come to pass. What would happen if instead of in our own energy and in our own strength try to make them happen, we took our five loaves and two small fish, which isn't much, and gave it to the Lord? What did he do? He took those five loaves and those two small fish and fed over 15,000 people, theologians say. Isn't that amazing? In your hands, very little. In his hands, an abundance. So if we can, give a warm welcome to Brandon as he comes on up here. So it's a little more chill tonight. We're, we're a small, uh, intimate time. So at the end of service, I'm opening it up to you guys to ask him any question you want. And yeah, there's no question off the table, right? No. Anything, anything. <laughs> Okay, so you guys can you guys can ask him anything. So remember that. But um, Brandon and I, uh, we go back, uh, we reconnected and stuff. I'm just thrilled to have him here because he has, I mean, he's a, he's got such an amazing testimony. Um, uh, so I guess why don't well why don't you introduce yourself? I guess first. Yeah, yeah I'm Brandon. <laughs> uh, I'm 32, and I've married to uh, my best friend for 10 years. Um, We've got two beautiful daughters, one's seven, one's four. Uh, I've just been blessed, and it's, it's unbelievable that I get to play baseball for a living and, and what God's done through my life to, to be able to share the things I've done and, and gone through. So let's go back to when you were 17, 18 years old, and uh, you were having a lot of problems, issues in life, and you had, I know you shared with me, um, from your childhood, some anger issues and stuff because of what happened with your, your parents and, and kind of ex- tell that story there. Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was about 11, 12 years old, my parents divorced, and uh, through that I had a lot of anger. Um, just a lot of things were going through my mind and, and through my body that I didn't know how to control. I didn't know how to control the anger. Um, there's always been a passion inside me for, for very many things, um, and that that anger took over passion, and, and as I got older, you know, going into uh, high school, um, I wanted to take my mind off my parents' divorce and off things that were uh, at home, so I, I decided I'm going into high school, I'm going to be the guy, I'm going to be the jock, I'm going to be that stud that, you know, everybody loves, everybody likes this guy, this guy's the, the best football player, the best baseball player, um, and I think I nailed it. But I was a jerk. Um, As I said earlier, though, <laughs> yeah, because this guy in high school was, uh, you, were, you were like, full, you were this size, but maybe not as big. Not yeah. as thick, and yeah. I was like 5'4", 100 pounds, soaking wet. Like, I wrestled 112 pounds, like, my junior year of high school. So he wasn't mean to me, though. I, I don't think you were. You, you were. He was always nice to me, but maybe it's because I was really small, you know. I was not the guy in high school, you know. God chose the small things of the world to yeah, so I, uh, I was the guy, and uh, I, I was macho. I wanted to be a tough guy. I hung around the wrong crowd. I fought, um, got into a lot of trouble. Um, I remember my, my junior year, um, I went out with a bunch of buddies. We ended up uh, getting into a huge fight, and we scrambled. We left. We got pulled over on the side of the highway off the 55 in Catella. I can remember it like it's yesterday, being handcuffed on the side of the highway. And at that time, I had a, a scholarship to UCLA for football, um, which is, was my dream at the time, because growing up, my parents didn't have money. And 
I knew the only way to get a college education was to get a scholarship. And I had it, and I was about to throw it away. Um, so somehow we got out of that. I lucked out. I got out of trouble. And uh, about a week later, I was invincible. I, I couldn't get trouble getting into fights. So um, I was at Ron John Surf Shop and, you know, not having money. I, I wanted a couple things. So I, I threw a couple things in my bag. Um, and I remember walking through the doors and the alarm sounding off. And next thing I'm in handcuffs. Um, I'm being dragged through the block, put in a cell, waiting for my mom or my dad to come pick me up. And at 17 years old, I got lucky because I, I wasn't I was still a minor. And uh, I just remember there and, and just being in disgust of myself and, and where I'm leading myself. Because not only am I disappointing myself, but my family, my parents who raised me and an opportunity to, to go to college. And uh, that's pretty much the trouble stopped there, which was, I was so thankful, but uh, I ended up having to do community service and classes and uh, paying fines, but I remember going to uh, a friend of mine, his dad was a pastor at a church, and I was like, this is going to be cake if he lets me do my community service there, and uh, I went up to him, I said, hey, I, I need some hours, could I, could I come to the church and help set up and stuff, and he's like, yeah, sure, you know, come set up, sit in the front row, take notes, and uh, you know, helps help break down at the end of the day. And I remember doing everything but taking notes and opening up my Bible. Um, and so I got no hours that day. And I was like, all right, well, maybe I'll open my Bible next time and he'll, he'll see me. So next week I, I opened my Bible. He actually, I didn't say in the first, I mean, he, him and his wife bought me my own Bible. And it was the first Bible I ever owned and uh, still have it. It's... Uh, it was just a blessing, and that's kind of where it all started for me. And I remember when my community service was done, I was hooked. I redevoted my life to Christ. Um, I'd given everything to him, and, and probably a couple weeks later, I was baptized. And I, I just gave it all to him at that point. And, uh, you know, there's times where I was still one foot in, one foot out. Um, but that comes with growing and learning and, and just giving it all to him. I, and um, from there... You were your your plan was football because yeah. I remember you didn't you didn't play baseball senior year of high school. No, right? I I ended up uh, quitting foot, uh, baseball to just concentrate on on my scholarship to UCLA and mm -hmm. uh, things happened where I was taking extra classes to to make sure I got into UCLA and I think God had a different plan and he uh, he brought in a new coach to UCLA and that coach didn't want me. So uh, my scholarship was taken away. I uh, ended up going back and playing in a baseball tournament with a bunch of friends. You know, we're 17, 18 years old. We end up going to the World Series. And uh, I have probably the best series of my life. I hit eight home runs in 10 games. I hit about 500. And one of my buddies comes up to me and goes, hey, you should play baseball. Mind, I haven't played baseball in two years. And I'm like, yeah, I'm way better at football. Like, that's my sport. I'm going to play football. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to the NFL. It's going to be done. I remember going back to my room that night, the dorm. We're out in South Carolina, and I'm, I'm just praying and just, you know, for guidance. I'm praying, help me, Lord. I, I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. And at this time, I'm still one foot in, one foot out. Um, I'm here. I'm there. You know, when I hang out with some friends, I'm out. I hang out with other friends, I'm in. Um, and I remember waking up that morning and and being like, it's it's baseball. And it had always been baseball since I was four years old. But he told me it's baseball. So I remember going with my dad, and we signed up for classes. My buddy got me a tryout with the coach. He, uh, he let me play with the team in the fall. And I ended up leading the team in, in almost every offensive category. And it came to the point where he was like, you're going to we're going to redshirt you, or we're gonna, you're going to make the team. And so I was like, oh, I can't take a year off. I, I could have just played football. But he came up to me at the end of the day. He said, hey, you made the team. Uh, and then I didn't play. I didn't play the first three games of the year. And at that time, I was like, I just got to I gotta make it happen. I've, I've got to give it to the Lord. And uh, the third game comes, fourth game comes, and he puts me in there. We're stomping somebody. And he's like, oh, you can go play now. So I was like, all right, I'll go play. So I, I ended up hitting two doubles and then starting the next game and hitting two doubles and a home run. 
And from that point on, I was All-State. Uh, I was freshman All-American and was drafted in the sixth round by the Houston Astros. Now, remember what he just said. He didn't play baseball for like two years. And God leads him to go play baseball. And he leads the college team in stats and then gets drafted by the Houston Astros. Like, that's pretty rad. That's pretty cool. Like I said this morning, that'd be like Josh. Well, I didn't play rugby, so it'd be like it'd be like me playing hockey. I play hockey with Josh here, and it'd be like me, you know, I'm gonna go try out for the Ducks, and then I'm, you know, playing at Honda Center next week, you know, or whatever. Like, they come on, come on, you know. But but what's awesome is is watching if his if you see his life, you see the hand of God on his life, and you see where he finally starts to um, submit or or say like, you know what? Yeah, not Brandon's plan, your plan, God, like what he did. And, and God literally led him to play baseball. That's awesome. Like, what is it God's leading you? What is God placed on the inside of you? Because the same results happen when you follow his plan, whatever it may be, whether it's pastoring, whether it's um, owning a business, whether it's, uh, you know, serving at a restaurant, whatever it might be, it's not about what you can produce. It's never been about what is in your hands and just your skills. It's your talents, your skills in his hands and him living through us. But it takes a, a humble person to submit and say, not my plan, what's your plan, God? And you can see the results here in, in, in Brandon's life, which is awesome. Um, but I know it wasn't a cakewalk from there after you got drafted um, many years in the minors with a couple times almost quitting. But don't you share that? Yeah, so I, I got drafted in the, the rookie ball team was out in Greenville, Tennessee. Um, I'm not going to say the sticks this time, but a uh, beautiful place in Tennessee. And, uh, you know, a kid from Orange County was kind of shell-shocked when I, when I showed up into the middle of nowhere. And I showed up, and everybody was better than me. All these guys were studs. And, and you come in, you're like, yeah, I'm the stud. Like, I was college, I, uh, all, CIA, or all state, you know, all-American. But everybody there is an all-American. Um, so I remember my first couple years just, I stunk. I was bad and came to a point where I called my wife one night. I said, hey, I'm going to quit. I'm going to go back and play football. I'm done. Thank the Lord. She said, no, the doors will be locked if you come home. So I continued to push and uh, I remember getting to a point uh, about seven years, six years later, you know, it was my seventh year and I'm in AAA. I'm a call away from the big leagues. And I'm just struggling. I'm hitting under 200. Uh, like I said earlier, you could have taken every player off the field, and I still couldn't get a hit. Uh, so I went back to my room that night. It was 4 in the morning. I couldn't sleep. I went out to the hall and called my pastor. And I said, I can't do this anymore. I feel like I'm, I'm wasting my life. I feel like God has way more in store for me than what I'm doing right now. Because you're not, you're not making big money, you're not... No, I was you, making about $1,000 a month. Wow. Um, and I was married, um, about to have our first child. So I was freaking out. Um, yeah. But I remember my pastor saying, he gave you these gifts for a reason. Use them for his glory. And so I just remember, I said, I'm going to play this game like I was a kid. And I'm going to give every accolade and everything that happens to the Lord because I play this game for him. He gave me these gifts, and these gifts I'm going to use for him. And I remember going into my coach's office the next day and saying, hey, can you send me down to double A? That's like you asking for you to have a, a lower job or, uh, you know, a deduction in your paycheck because I was going from making like $1,100 to making like $800 with that. But it wasn't about that. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about where I was. It was about where God wanted me. And I remember him telling me like, no, it's probably not going to happen. You're just going to sit here and sit the pine. So I was like, oh, okay, whatever. So came in after the game. He says, you're that's sit the bench for those. That, yeah, that the bench. Sit the pine, sit the bench. <laughs> And uh, he sent me back to Double A, and I ended up having a great end of the year and became a free agent. Got to go to my first major league camp with the Astros the next year. Got 10 at bats, and it was the first cut. <laughs> they sent me back to minor league camp. They told me I was going to go to Triple A, and it just another another uh, fork in the road, or you know, another just thing that was just boulder was in my ways. I got there, last day of camp, and 
you're going to go to double A again. I've been in double A for three years, and I was like, all right, it is what it is. I'm going to go out there and have fun. And I remember my coach coming up to me and said, Brandon, you could be as mad as you want for 24 hours, but I need Brandon ready to go when it's opening day. I said, I don't need it. I said, I got God, and that's all I need. And so I showed up the first two weeks of the season. I was Texas League Player of the Week. Uh, after the f second month, I got called up to AAA, and I was leading the league in average. And I remember one of our guys in the major leagues, the center fielder, ran into a wall in Atlanta, broke his shoulder. Bummer. And yeah, bummer. <laughs> but uh, we were in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we're playing against the Angels farm team. And Cal Cal Cole Calhoun hits a home run to walk us off that night. And I remember my manager always asked me, like, where the pitch was? Where was it? And so he called me in his office after the game and said, uh, where's Brandon been? I need the guy that comes out with the same energy every single day. He's like, where's the guy with the, the uh, why am I drawing a salt button? The salt and vinegar running through his veins. I need the guy that gives everything. And I said, hey, I'm the same guy. I've just been struggling, and I don't want to show my emotion, so I'm just going to stay level-headed. He said, no, I need that guy back. I said, I'm the same guy. And I started getting mad. I started almost like raising my voice at my manager. And the next thing he says, he said, good, you're going to go to the major leagues tomorrow. And at that moment, I, I remember pulling my shirt over my face and crying for about 15 minutes just because it had been such a grind, and it was eight years in the making. And I remember taking my shirt down and, and seeing every coach just tears running down their face because they had been along with the ride with me. And it was just a, a beautiful moment of God working through the struggles and helping me. And as soon as I let it go, it was there. It was my dream came true. And uh, almost a year to the date where I called my pastor the year before I got called up to the major leagues and got to play my first game. I showed up in Houston. Uh, I now, was Now, you didn't really get into this a whole lot in the morning service, but I kind of wanted to dig deeper yeah. about the, the steak and the stuff inside the clubhouse that you said. Oh. <laughs> the, the, so, what yeah. does the clubhouse no, look so, like? <laughs> you know, I, I, the major leagues is like heaven on earth. <laughs> it's You show up and it's there's chefs there. There's, oh, wow. you know, whatever cleats you need or bats and food and, I mean, any snack, you any drink, and it's just it's all there for you. They make it very easy for you to want to stay. <laughs> Um, so I show up and I'm just looking around like, this is way too much for me. I've, I've been eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every night. Um, but I remember looking at the lineup and being like, oh gosh, I'm in the lineup first day. So I got to play my first major league game that night and my dad, my pastor, my best friend, uh, my wife and my daughter were all there and didn't get a hit. I grounded out three straight times with the second baseman. Um, it wasn't until the following night where I came in on my third at bat, I got hit over the second baseman's head. So it finally fell in, and it was the first of many. Uh, it was a blessing, and it was, you know, only God-given. That's so cool. And I'm sure you can probably vividly remember that day that you got the call up from the big leagues and stuff. Like, I can uh, only imagine, like, a, a lifelong dream, and then all of a sudden, after all those years of grinding, you get it. Like, that's, that's the God thing right there. That's yeah, so cool. Yeah, it's all him. That's awesome. Now, and then, um, so from that, <laughs> I know uh, you played, that was, was that 2013, right? That was, was that? That was 2012. Oh, 2012. And then in 2013 is the greatest day of your life? Greatest day of my Tell life. You know, I've had, I've had a couple, you know, between marrying my best friend and having, you know, the birth of my first child, um, you know, my major league debut, but I don't think there will be a, a day that beats what I'm about to tell you. Um, so 2013 is my first full camp in, in spring training. I, I make the team. Uh, I'm going to be the platoon right fielder, and I'm going to play in the major leagues for the first full season of my career. Uh, rookie, had to dress up and do all the goofy stuff on the, on the bus. But uh, I remember struggling towards the second or the, the end of the first half. We had about a week left. We're in Tampa Bay and we're in a room, we're in a hotel room with 
uh, a couple of my buddies, Carlos Pena, Justin Maxwell, and a friend uh, who played about eight years in the major leagues, uh, Luke Scott. And all of us are, are very religious, and we like to, to talk about it. And, you know, being on the road and being away from your church and your family and your friends, you, you have you cling to other guys who are or do the same thing and believe in the same thing and have the same faith. And so we got in this room, and we were just talking about everything, about life, about family, friends, politics, you know, you name it, we were talking about it. And at the end of the night, it's about 1 o'clock, and Luke asked if he could pray for everybody before we go to bed. And uh, it was probably the most powerful prayer I've ever been a part of. Um, if you've ever been in a prayer where someone's speaking in tongues, it's unreal. It's probably the coolest thing I've ever been a part of. I get chills thinking about it right now, but you know, sitting there praying, and Luke's praying over us, and I had struggled, and me and my wife were, were trying to have a baby for about six, seven months. Um, we had complications the first two times, and then um, we finally had our first daughter, and so we, we were going through those complications again, and, you know, we were just praying in that room for it, and I remember this, this this hover around me and this this it just felt like the holy spirit was was on top of me and taking it back to my room it's about two o'clock now and i lay in bed and it's just that presence is there and i'm in a hotel room by myself and i'm kind of freaking out right now because there's something in my room but i don't know i don't see anything i don't hear anything and then all of a sudden all i hear is i've got your back i've got your back about 200 times. That's all I heard for two hours. It's about 3.30. I finally fall asleep. And I, I go home. We fly back the next day to Houston. And I'm telling my wife, you wouldn't believe, but God spoke to me. I don't know if it was God directly. It could have been the Holy Spirit. Um, but it overcame me. And my wife was just in almost disbelief. Because, you know, things don't happen like this all the time. And so I had told her what had happened, and I remember not touching a bat for three days, uh, all-star break, just wanted to spend time with the family. And first game back, it's uh, playing the Seattle Mariners. And Joe Saunders is pitching, but why don't we let him watch it? It was the first day after the all-star break. I had struggled uh, the last couple weeks before the all-star break. I can remember this so vividly. I was laying in my bed and being a religious guy, you know, I felt like I had God in my ear telling me that I don't worry, I've got your back. Me and my wife were also trying to have a second child at the time. And she, and she was praying a lot and I was praying. And so that first day after the All-Star break, we go out, we're playing the Mariners, Joe Saunders is pitching. My first at bat, I hit a home run. That's in the air and deep to left center field. Barnes gives it a long run, and Brandon Barnes will take the tour. I get a feeling Brandon Barnes had a talk with himself over the All-Star break. Play more aggressive, his style of play. I was like, okay, this is a good start to the day, you know. I'm feeling this. Second at bat, uh, triple right center gap. Still not thinking about, you know, I could hit for the cycle or whatever, but, you know, I've got two of the harder hits out of the way, you know, let's just keep this rolling. It was a tight ball game. I go up there for my third at bat. I mean, I hit just a C&I single. It just kind of rolls through the infield. Three for three, Brandon Barnes. Homer, triple, single. Obviously, it would be fun if he could parlay this into a cycle night. I come up for my fourth at bat. I know what I need. I'm pretty sure everybody else in the ballpark knew what I needed, and uh, I hit it, went right down first baseline. I was just hauling, trying to do everything I could to get to second base. Dove in, he called me safe. And shoots one up the right field line. Let's see if he can get to second. He's going to give it a shot. Here's the throw from Saunders, and he is safe. It's a cycle from Brandon Barnes. I was just in awe of what I had just done because how rare it is. And I never thought in a million years that I would hit for the cycle in the big leagues. Being able to do that was, was special, and to have my wife and my daughter there, and then going home that night, my wife's giving my daughter a bath, and I'm in the other room eating dinner, and uh, she calls me in. I was like, okay, I guess I gotta hurry up. She sounded kind of worried or something, so I, I run in there. My wife actually put the little sticky letters that you use in the bathtub for the kids, said I'm gonna be a sister, 
uh, on the wall, and I, I kind of stopped for a minute, and I was like, this has got to be one of the best days of my life. I just hit for the cycle, and now that we've, we've been struggling to have a, a child for over six months, uh, and it all happens in the same day, was, was a miracle, and it was something that's only God-given, and to be able to see the joy on my daughter's face and my wife's face, and then to see the joy on my face was, was priceless. That's awesome. The same day. The same day. We, Angela and I have kind of been saying that now. We, God's got this. God's got your back <laughs> about everything. But, like, it's, it's so true because, um, and I actually didn't say this earlier, but one of the things you shared with me, and um, I still don't know if you do this every at-bat, but, um, you know, one of the things you said is, you know, before every pitch, you step out of the batter's box and he takes a deep breath and God's got my back, you know, says that to himself. And, and when he told me that, I was thinking about life application. I'm thinking, man, I could do that in every area of my life. Like, think about it. Like, um, before I do anything, I can invite the Holy Spirit into that moment. Just through, we don't realize the power of our mind. We think sometimes religion has kind of talked down our mind, like, you know, like, you know different things. But faith can't, pass the way you think because it says in Romans 12 2 what uh, be not conformed to this world but be transformed by what the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good acceptable and perfect will of God so the thing keeping you from seeing God's will in your life isn't God holding and withholding from you it's your unrenewed mind the world is trying to conform you and put you into this box. God's saying, don't be conformed, be transformed with my words. Put those. And so this is an opportunity. I mean, it's just so practical and it's so cool because in his job as a baseball player, which is really cool and kind of like not fair, but whatever, you know. Um, no, I love what I do, you know. But, um, but you know, before every... <laughs> Before, I love what I do. I love Jesus. But before, you know, you, he gets to see a pitch, he gets to stop and say, God, you got my back. Like, wow. And we've been doing that. We're potty training Layla. God, you got our back. You got this. Uh, you know, whatever you're doing, you can invite the Holy Spirit. And what is that? You're renewing your mind. You're absolutely renewing your mind to the truth that God is with you to the truth that he does have your best interests, that he does love you, he is there, and he wants to help you. He wants to live through you. He wants to. And it's renewing your mind, and eventually it becomes such a way of life where you're like Jesus, where you say to everybody, hey, look, it ain't me doing it. It's the Father within me. He does the works. Because Jesus was so renewed. He has, his mind was so, in, it was perfect. It was the perfect mind. And you would say, well, that's Jesus. But then guess what his 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says? You have the mind of Christ. Whoa, the potential that is in us. That's awesome. Brandon, did you have anything else to say before we open it up to any questions? Uh, one thing I'll leave you guys with is when my life changed, it was when I took that other foot out and I dove in head first. Um, so if there's any of you that are one foot in, one foot out, dive in. It'll change your life. It'll be so worth it. Um, not only for my testimony, for Josh as well. Um, spoke about, we talked about his story and, you know, just how many people you talk about what you're going through. And if you dive headfirst into Christ, there's nothing better. Nothing. And only good things will happen. There'll be struggles. There'll be times where it hurts, but he will always pull you out of it. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Well, can we give him a hand real quick? Thank you, Brandon. Now, it's not every day you get a major league baseball player in a room of a few people here. So if you have any questions whatsoever, now's the time to ask. It's pretty cool. Anybody got a question? Anybody Don't have be anything? Scared. Don't be scared. Come on, somebody. Angela, I know you, I had you reserve a couple just in case nobody <laughs> wanted to raise their hand. No? Oh, gosh. We're in trouble. 
nobody likes me. Okay, fine. Well, then, I know. Gosh, you guys don't have to be afraid. Okay, well, uh, tell me about the story about your dream of hitting a home run at Angel Stadium. Oh, we got to do this again? Yeah, I want to hear it again. It's pretty cool. Um, so, since I was four years old, you know, I've always gone to Angels games. I've lived and died with the Angels. Um, so, I remember being younger and always being telling my grandfather, I'm going to play in Angel Stadium as a Major League Baseball player, not as a high school kid playing the CIF championship. I'm going to play in that stadium as a Major League Baseball player. And I got the opportunity in 2013. I uh, was playing, uh, I forget, it was like our second series there of the year. And I probably had 40, 50 people in the stands, family, friends. And I had mapped this out for so long. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to hit a home run. I'm going to just pose for a second and then I'm gonna throw my bat and I'm gonna jog slowly around so my parents and my family and my friends could all enjoy it and then as soon as I touch home plate I'm gonna you know do my thing that I always do and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna point to my family and just say thank you and so I get up there my second at bat of the night and I hit this curveball just crush it and I'm like here it is here it is I'm holding my bat I throw it and I start to jog and then I realize Mike Trout's in left field and I see him jump up over the fence, grab the ball, and my dreams were deflated. <laughs> but it was just an amazing day. And I, and I will always be able to say that one of the greatest baseball players of all time stole my dream. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love that story. Anybody, have, anyone, anyone, questions, concerns, comments? Oh, oh, we got a couple. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. I was growing up, I was a baseball rat. So I, I mean, I knew everybody. Um, one of the guys I really looked up to was Tim Salmon and Gary DeSarcina. Um, I was in A ball, and Gary was the manager for the Red Sox minor league team and got to go up and introduce myself and told him I'd been watching him since I was a kid. Um, so I got an opportunity to meet him, and then that same time where Mike Trout robbed my home run. I got to meet Tim Salmon as he was doing on-field stuff, and uh, it was pretty cool. And I've got to meet a lot of cool people. I've got to meet, you know, one of the best, probably the best closer of all time, Mariano Rivera. I'm not going to say I'm hitting a thousand off him, but um, it was just—it's awesome because I, you know, I've got to play for so long that over the years I've got to met, meet so many special players, and um, it's just been—it's been an honor. Yeah, if you ask my oldest, she can't stand it. Um, she's a big daddy's girl. She she understands it. She's old enough where she understands what's going on, and daddy has to leave for work. Um, my oldest one, or my youngest one, kicks me out of the house. She's a big mommy's girl, so she doesn't, she's, get out, dad, go play baseball. Um, but it's tough. It, I think it's more tough on my wife than anything. Um, you know, because for six months out of the year, seven months out of the year, she's a single mom. Uh, so I do as much as I can to help while I'm home. Uh, but, you know, they, they make trips out. And when, when the kids were younger, they got to travel with me and, and spend time in different cities, which is really cool. But, um, yeah, if you ask each individual, one of them, they'll tell you differently. But... Fantastic question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I've encountered this where, you know, you know, you're in this deep depth and you can't get out of it, and you're asking God for everything, and you're asking for all this help, and then you climb out of it, and you're on top, right? You're on top, and then you're just kind of like, oh, well, I'm not asking anymore. But, and I found out, you know, when you make this success, He can always pull the rug out and humble you. Um, so I, I know in, in 
times when everything's going right, and I had a really good year this year, and a lot of things went well for me, and I just remember that because I've had success, and he's humbled me. And so when I get to the top, I thank him, and I thank him, and I ask him not for more success, but to just keep me going, um, to keep me pushing and, and using this, this game as an altar for him. That's all. That, that's key. I, what was I reading? And um, oh, in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it, it's actually like what you just said is actual scripture. It said, um, uh, um, um, I'm <laughs> drawing a blank, but it, it's, it's, it's basically um, uh, watch, watch one another, make sure that nobody falls short of the grace of God, lest the root of bitterness entering in um, uh, cause destruction in your life. And um, what he's saying here is a lot of times what happens is, and in his, his question, um, I just read a quote recently, and I forget who it was. They said that it's not the troubles that people go through that reveal a man. It is not hard to cry out to God when you're broken. It is not hard to cry out to God when you're on the ground. Your real self and your true character is revealed when you're successful. You want to see what's really inside of a man? Let him be successful, and you'll see what's the true character of somebody. And that is reality. And that is why when people become successful and they don't remain thank you, it opens up the door to the root of bitterness to enter in and cause destruction. I'm telling you, one of the greatest things you can do is remain thankful. That, that's huge. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's you know, in baseball, because it's, it's such an up-and-down sport where you can have a good night and then you're going to have a bad night. Um, it was, I was thankful for the nights I didn't get hits, and I was thankful for nights that I got hits because I got to do what I love to do. And when you get to do what you love to do and you get to show Christ through that, I think that's life-changing. She just got engaged yesterday, so she's. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Um, so going back to that story when I was 17 years old and I got in a fight that was over my wife, who was dating my best friend at the time. And it was like a short little two-week high school fling or whatever, but um, he was kind of crazy and he wanted to go fight some guys over her. And so... We ended up getting this thing, and uh, when we met wasn't for probably another two years after that when I was at college playing, and we met in, in the weight room. She was a high jumper, and uh, I had already redevoted myself to Christ at that point, and um, once we started dating, I was already off in pro ball, and she kind of was back home, and uh, when she finally we finally got married, she started traveling with me. Um, it made it a lot easier, and... It was nice because I got to share the love of Christ that I have with her because she grew up in the church, but not in the church. And uh, I got to, I was telling him this story the other day, but I got to, uh, I got to actually baptize my wife when she was 27 years old. Um, so it was, it was, it was special and, and we kind of, we push each other with our faith and um, when I'm having bad days, you know, she knows I'm having a bad day or, or a bad week in baseball. She'll text me a Bible verse, and um, I've actually got one that she uh, sent me one day when I was thinking I was going to quit. So I got it tattooed on my side, and um, she's just she's been my rock. So um, it's been special. Oh yeah, he's yeah. Got a lot I got a lot. I got. I've got. Covered up, man. Yeah, I'm trying to be respectful. <laughs> no, um, this is church it's of just grace, co it's, man. It's this cold is outside, man. Uh, no, I have my whole left leg done. I've got both arms. I've got my back. Um, I think, obviously, you know, my ring. I've got my wife's initial, and I've got each kid's hand on my side, like they're climbing oh, on me, like cool. they need me. Um, and then I have one on the inside of my arm. It's Jesus' hand getting nailed to the cross because for me, that significance is what he did for me, mm. what he gave up and what he wanted to do for each and every one of us. 
So every day I'm able to look at that and say thank you and, and just be blessed. That's cool. Daniel, I know you got a question. <laughs> Going over here. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, there's been so many guys I've come across in 15 years, you know, I've been playing this game for 15 years, and uh, from the day I got in to pro ball, my life has been so much different now, but through my last five years, as I've gotten older, and I'm, I'm the older guy in every team I play with, um, I try to take those younger guys under my wing. Um, some of them don't want the help but uh, I try to instill the things that I've learned, um, not only just baseball, but faith and, and what I believe in, character, um, and try to help those guys. And we have a group, you know, we try to set up a group on every team I'm on um, where we can get together, we can pray for each other. We pray before the game, we can pray after the game, if someone's struggling. Um, because every guy's still just a normal guy and they have issues at home. Um, I remember... Uh, a teammate that I played with who was going through, um, he had twin. his wife was having twins and one of them actually passed away during, during the baseball season. And so, you know, it, it happens to every one of us. And, and, you know, to have a group of guys who are faith um, oriented and who love Jesus and we're able to share with each other, um, it makes it a little bit easier in those hard times to, to kind of connect with these guys. Well, we'll go ahead and end the questions there. Um, why don't we uh, give him a, an applause? Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it, man. Thank you, guys.